thank you for joining us for the BPM Change Management PRR Review Monthly Meeting. My name is Christina Costa, representing ISO Customer Readiness, and I will be facilitating today's web conference. Next slide, please. Today's call is being recorded. These recordings are for informational and convenience purposes only, and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. As a reminder, these monthly calls are structured to stimulate an honest dialogue and engage different perspectives. While we welcome comments and questions, please remember to keep comments professional and respectful. Next slide, please. We will be taking questions throughout the call today. If you are dialed in by phone only and not on the WebEx, you can enter the question queue at any time by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. If you connected audio through the WebEx platform, please use the raise hand feature located above the chat box on the lower right hand side of your screen. Please introduce yourself before asking your question. If you need technical assistance during the call today, please send a chat message to the event producer. Next slide, please. Excuse me. <clears throat> the purpose of today's meeting is to discuss the proposed revision requests that are in the initial or recommendation stage of the process. We will be discussing 17 PRRs today. Eight are in the initial stage and nine are in the recommendation stage. 16 PRRs were submitted by the ISO and one was submitted by Western Power Trading Forum. Next slide, please. The business practice manuals uh, of the ISO, the purpose of the BPMs is to set forth business practices that implement the ISO tariff. The ISO conducts a yearly policy initiative roadmap pro process to consider and rank initiatives. Policy changes submitted through the PRR process will be referred to the policy initiative roadmap process. Each subject area in a BPM is based on enabling language in the ISO tariff. The PRR process cannot be used to introduce changes that are not supported by existing tariff authority. Next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna start today with the reliability requirements BPM. We'll um, turn that over to Melanie to discuss those. Next slide, please. This is Melanie. PRR is 1490, which was clarification for pumping load bidding rule. The reason for this revision was a minor update to align the language in the tariff to the BPM in regards to bidding requirements for pumping load. Previously, section 7.1.1 in the BPM created one standard bidding rule for use limited resources. However, for pumping load, tariff section 40.6.4.2 sets no rec bidding requirement for pumping load, use limited or not. This revision will apply the same bidding requirements for pumping load, whether it's use limited or not. Uh, there's initial comment, but we haven't had any in the recommendation stage. And the next step is the post final decision. Were there any questions for the PRR? There are currently no questions in queue. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next slide then, please. My apologies, there is one. My apologies. Michelle Quito does have her hand raised. Michelle, please go ahead. Michelle, I've unmuted your line. You may go ahead. Sure. Can you just explain, does that mean that there is no rough bidding requirement for any pumping load? Uh, yeah, so no rough uh, bidding requirement for pumping load, whether it's use limited or not. Okay, thanks. I just didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, that's all the hands raised I see for now. Thank you very much. Oh, next slide, please. And right, now, next PRR is 1508, which is clarifications to new use import commitment submission and processing. The reason for this revision was to provide detailed instruction to load serving entities to properly submit new use import commitment templates and explains how they are processed. There is no change to the existing procedure, but the revision helps provide clarification for the process. 
This is an emergency PRR because it is effective immediately. Um, it was effective May 17th, and the LSEs must submit the uh, new use import commitment starting the 17th and before the end of this month, and this clarification explains what to submit and how it is processed. There were no comments initially, and the initial comment period expires June 14th. Um, the next steps, the initial comments. Are there any questions for this PRR? We do have questions in queue. Michelle, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from Energy Division. Can you explain whether this is um, requiring LSEs to submit NIC requirements? Is this to effectuate um, the Wheeling TSMSP? Because that hasn't been filed with FERC yet. So I'm, I'm kind of confused about this. Hi, Michelle. This is this is Catalin. Um, no, this doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, this is just uh, explanation and clarification how the LSEs need to submit the template in order to get new use import commitment status um, under step 4B so they can get a um, MIC lock starting next year. It just clarifies, you know, how many templates they need to send depending if they lock before, in a year before, or there's a new lock uh, for the same contract. It also tells them you know what? What are the requirements to held um, the 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 rights and and how do we process them? It has nothing to do with wheels. It's just for make. How do you lock make up with new use import commitment contracts for next year? Well, why is this emergency? I thought we had the new use imports for, in place for quite some time. That's what I'm a little confused about. We had the new use import commitment from from last year. Uh, it was approved two years ago. So, um, but there were no explanations in in the BPM about how they get processed, how to submit the template, what does held mean. So there were there were a few clarifications um, that that were required because we just had too many questions from, from LSEs, exactly what they need to do. So this one, it clarifies exactly how they need to submit the templates, when they need to submit the templates, when they need to held remaining input capability, how they need to get the remaining input capability, and how to show that to us. And have you allocated any new use import capability previously? Yes, we had a handful of them next last year, um, and they're public on the ISO website, there is a step six Excel spreadsheet. And once you open that spreadsheet, you can sort it by new use simple commitments. So you can see how many were, were approved previously, but we are just expecting more and more, uh, you know, because we, we realize that more and more people have um, contracts um, that are approved now, and we gonna, we expect to get more and more requests and the LSEs um, were just confused how to submit uh, the data. Okay, thank you. Do you have another question in queue? Bonnie, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Bonnie Blair, I represent the Six Cities Group. Um, can you identify the tariff authority behind PRR 1508? Yes, the the authority under the tariff is the MIC allocation process. This is step 4B. In order to receive a, um, a, a an allocation at the branch group for next year under step 4B, you need to sign up as a new use import commitment. And there is an entire section in a tariff about new use import commitments that was included two years ago. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I can start looking for it and get back to you in a couple of seconds here. Okay, that yeah, it would be great. I could try to find it, but hopefully you can find it faster.
Catalin, did you want us to wait on you to find that or did you want to just to provide that in the chat? And we can move on to the next PR. And, and I, I, can, I, do have a, I do have a follow up question. Um, okay, okay. Don't wait. Thank you for letting me know. Hi, you want to go with the follow up questions while I look for this? Sure. Let, yeah, I can do that. And and I and I'm fine if you know to have you give me the or give us the the tariff section in the chat box um, or you know offline or whatever. But um, so I I want to make sure I understand the implications of the PRR um, text. Um, does this effectively mean that if you don't have an executed RA contract by the end of May in any given year, you can't get a new use import commitment for that contract? In other words, does this effectively advance the timeline by which LSEs have to have are a import contracts in place? No, there is no advancement there. There is no changes. So um, I have the section number for you. The section number is 4040.4.6.2.2.4. It's called reserving import capability as new use import commitment. You can see in that section, the contract needs to be signed by May 15. So, so it's already spelled in the tariff that the deadline, the contract needs to be signed by in order to receive new use import commitment for the next RA year. So the, the way it works, you receive new use import commitment. Um, uh, you, you receive remaining import capability, meaning unlock mix through the regular allocation process that starts on July 1st and ends sometime in August. And between that date and next May 15, you have, you know, nine months or so to sign the contract. If you did sign a contract that actually applies to the year after that, starting, you know, in 2020, either in 2023, let's say, Let's say you got this last year in 2022, if your contract starts in 2023 or in 2024, as long as it goes across three summer months in 2024, you can receive new use import commitment status, you know, if you meet the rest of the requirements. There is a lot of requirements, so please read both the tariff and the BPM. Uh, there is requirements that you can only sign pseudo ties or dynamic schedules, and there, there's a few other requirements, including LSE-specific requirements. So, you know, if you meet all the requirements that you can sign, then you can, you can put it in a template, send it to us, we verify all the data, and, and then, you know, you can have new use import commitment status for next year, and you can get allocation on the branch group you want to, um, you know, based on four step B. And the clarification here is the clarification how to submit the templates, when to submit the templates, what to put in the templates. You know, we had a lot of questions from LSE, so we're trying to make it clear exactly what you need to submit. But but all of the dates and all the templates were there before. And as I said, uh, please read both the tariff and the BPM for new use import commitment. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and I think that's helpful background. All right, I do not see any additional questions in queue at this time. Go ahead and move to the next slide. The next six PRRs are in settlements and billing, and we'll go to Massey to address those. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Christina. Actually, can we go back to the previous slide, please? My apologies. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. My name is Massey Amadi, and I'm going to go over these uh, six uh, settlement PRRs. Before we dive in, uh, in into each uh, PRR, I want to um, discuss 
uh, or uh, what happened recently and why are we taking this step. So this is <clears throat> the, the six PRRs. These are all part of the uh, summer release. Um, and uh, there are three uh, enhancements and three defects within the six PRRs. This is the second time we're bringing this up to BPM call. Normally, we would have this uh, stage as final, but as you notice here, the stage is on recommendation. And the reason for that is, uh, number one, we've uh, moved the summer release date from June 1st to July 1st. We wanna give market participant additional month to review these uh, PRRs and submit any questions they have. So what we did is we went in and we updated the BPM associated to each PRR to reflect a uh, start date of 7-1 rather than 6-1. In addition to that, uh, during market sim, we found issues with uh, two of these PRRs, 1491 and 1492. This is uh, ASSOC and RSEE phase two. We will update the uh, BPM uh, associated to these two PRRs by end of this week. And there are some formula changes on these two um, BPMs. So for those reasons, we have um, added one more month of review time for market participants to review and give us feedback. And we will bring this up, all these six PRRs again uh, at the end of uh, June during our regular uh, BPM calls. So we'll have three months of, uh, instead of two months, we'll have three months of uh, discussion on these six settlement PRRs. Any questions before we start diving into each PRR? There are currently no questions in queue. Okay, thank you. Can we proceed to the next uh, slide, please? So PRR 1491, this is associated with ASSOC, Ancillary Service State of Charge. Uh, the deployment date and <clears throat> the deployment date is 7-1. However, this uh, enhancement, the effective trade date goes back to last year. So the effective trade date on this is September 20th of 2022. Um, the code will be dropped on 7-1. Uh, the recommendation, we haven't received any comments. Uh, the recommendation will expire, and already expired on May 16th. Next step is post recommendation. Any questions on PR 1491? There are currently no questions in queue. Thank you. Next slide, please. PR 1492. This is associated to RSEE, which stands for Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancement Phase 2. The effective date is uh, July 1st, 2023. Uh, this is the same as the trade date. Uh, no uh, recommendation comments received. Uh, recommendation comment expired May 16th. Next step is to post recommendation. Any question on PR 1492? Um, there are currently no questions in queue. Thank you. Next slide, please. PR 1493. This change, um, we have to make the change to the charge group pre calc or system resource uh, deem uh, delivered energy quantity to accommodate logic meter. And the effective trade date is uh, July 1st. We haven't received any comments on this. Uh, comment expired on May 16th. And next step is to post recommendation. Any questions on 1493? There are currently no questions in queue. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. PR 1494. This is a this change has to do with the pre-calc meter subsystem deviation penalty to accurately account for resources with spin and non-spin. The effective trade date is July 1st. We haven't received any comments. Comment period expired May 16th. Next step is to post recommendation. Any questions on 1494?
there are currently no questions in queue. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. Fourteen ninety five is associated to changes to meter demand um, charge group, which are eighteen uh, eighty nine eighty nine and eighty nine ninety nine. These two charge codes have been impacted, and the trade date effective trade date is July first. No comments. We haven't received any recommendation comments, and the comment expire May sixteen. Next step is to post recommendation. Any question on fourteen ninety five? There are currently no questions in queue. Thank you. Next slide, please. And lastly, 1499, this is associated with the hybrid 2C. Uh, this is an enhancement, and we, uh, the trade date is uh, July 1st. We haven't received any recommendation comments. Recommendation expired, comments were expired May 16th. Next step is to post recommendation. Any question on 1499 hybrid 2C? There are currently no questions in queue. Thank you, Michelle. Go to the next slide, please. As a reminder, if you're dialed in by phone, you can use the pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue, or on the WebEx platform, use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. I believe we are first starting with uh, Kevin Head for uh, 1496. Uh, yeah, we, we're just going to keep this one in the initial phase, I believe, so I don't have any Thing to add. Okay, do you want to um, uh, next slide, please, and you can present that um, and just comment on that. Kevin, did you say that we were going to keep this in the initial stage? Correct. Yes. Okay. So. Um, uh, despite what the slide says, we will update that in the B, in the PRR itself, so that we'll keep this in the in the initial stage. Do we want to move on? Does anyone have any questions on that? Um, there are currently no questions in queue. Okay, we can proceed to the next slide, please. And I believe CB will be presenting. Good morning. Um, so this uh, PRR uh, deals primarily with um, RSE related reporting um, and it moves two of the reports, capacity test result report and the flex ramp test results report from CMRI to OASIS um, and also creates a real time market bid cap report. Um, and one thing we wanted to note here is that we are not creating a new assistance energy transfer report in OASIS. So that was, that was just an inadvertent um, mistake in the BPM language. Um, so you'll, a, the assistance energy transfer status for BAAs uh, will be visible though um, through BAYOP um, and also reflected in settlements. So that's it, I think, on this one. Do you have a question in queue? Call your line is on mute. You may go ahead. Yeah, this is Michelle from the Energy Division. Are you saying that um, that energy you won't know whether people have opted into or out of energy assistance transfers, except everyone will know whether Kaiso has opted in because we do a market notice? Is that is that what you're saying? No, I I think I think you will know it just not through Oasis, but through Bayop. Well, um, if is Bay Up available to everyone, who is Bay Up available to? My understanding is available to all the BAAs, but someone else can jump in here. I'm I'm filling in for Michael on this, Michael Martin. But um, so the Kaiser knows, yeah. but the LSEs within Kaiser don't know whether. 
So all other balancing authorities know that California, the California BIA is entered because we do a market notice. Does CAISO or do the LSEs within CAISO? Because other balancing authorities are utilities, right? Like BPA or Idaho Power. Do our utilities know as much as they do? I'm not sure. Um, well, so uh, exactly. CB, CB, I'll jump in. This is Heather. I mean, Michelle. So, so there's the the reporting at the balancing authority level. So, each balancing authority in the WEEM will have visibility through through BAYOP. I think you're asking about do so, Heather, the can I just ask, yeah, do they have a um, so does each balancing authority have insight into every other authority? Okay, so okay, so that's the question. Um, are, are all the and I believe the answer is yes. Danny, are you able to confirm since we don't have Michael, or is that something we need to follow? Yes, up? through Bayoff, they would all have the ability to see the opt-in, opt-out status of okay. The rest so of the balancing are, authority areas. Other balancing authorities are congruent with you know load-serving entities, right, and also generators. So you know, Portland General Electric, BPA, Idaho Power. Do the entities within California have access to what other BAAs have done? And if not, why not? Well, well the, the BAAs have the same access. Each balancing authority has the same access. Do the members that constitute that balancing authority have information sharing that allows insight, I think is what you're asking, that second level down. And so we're not controlling the access that the balancing authorities say, I think you keep saying BPA or Portland General, how they distribute that information to, to the folks in their balancing authorities is not something we are controlling, though okay, we well, are maybe. providing visibility. Hold on, let me finish. We CAISO is providing visibility to its LSEs through the market notice process. And does CAISO and notify its LSEs whether other balancing authorities have opted into the Energy assistance program. I don't know why we would need to notify our LSEs about others elections. I think we're happy to take some comments on that, that this isn't a th uh, an issue that's come up, but this would need to be uh, socialized with the other balancing authorities um, about how, you know, we're obligating either their sharing of information or whatnot. If, if there's a concern about some sort of secret information or, or an asymmetry of disclosure, we, we'd appreciate understanding what the concern is. But but at this point, our LSE, the, the point of the market notice is to ensure the members of the California Balancing Authority area are informed of the decision so that in, ensure that it's consistent with, you know, criteria tariff authority, we'll get to those other things. But, but it's an information for internal. The bay off is how the WEAM entities view the information amongst themselves. Okay, thanks for that clarification. All right, I do not see any additional, let me just double check that. I don't see any additional questions in, in queue. I think that's it from, from my standpoint. Thank you, Christina. And I do not see any additional questions or chats in queue. Christina, as you're talking, you are on mute. We are unable to hear you. Sorry about that. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide for PRR 1502. And Mike Rue will be presenting that. Good morning. Uh, for this one, it's just clarification to the component level dispatchable flag. So that's to clarify the definition of the dispatchable flag component in relation to hybrid resources. Uh, currently, there are no initial comments. That uh, initial comment period will expire May 16th, or looks like it already expired, sorry. And next step is post recommendation. All 
All right, I don't see any questions in queue. Okay, we can move to the next slide, PRR 1507, and Jacob Fox will be presenting that, please. Uh, so PRR 1507 is the uh, Western Energy Imbalance Market Washington Greenhouse Gas Enhancements. So this change is related to the Washington WAM GHG enhancements. Uh, so this change includes updated calculations for the default energy bids and commitment costs for resources subject to the Washington GHG, GHG compliance program. Um, this is a temporary alternative solution that will remain in effect until the full functionality can be implemented. We expect that in fall 2023. Uh, this is an emergency PRR and was effective on 5.1. Uh, there were no initial comments, and the initial comment period expired May 16th. So our next step is to post recommendations. All right, I do not see any questions in queue. Okay, we can move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> The next group of PRRs is for the market operations BPM, and we will first start with CB for PRR 1497. Thank you. Um, good morning. I think we can go to the next slide here. Okay. Uh, 1497 deals with uh, tagging rule changes, um, and the only update for today, I think, is that um, this will, these changes or rules rather will not be required until July 1st, um, which is a change from June 1st. Uh, but but uh, SEs can, can start on June 1st if they want, but the requirement won't become binding until July 1st. We have a question in queue. Hey. Michelle, your lines are muted. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from the Energy Division. Hey, so we had written a comment on this, and I don't feel like I got a very clear answer to this. So the tariff says that you can cut LPT exports before an EEA-3, um, but in the BPM, I see language that says that you can only cut in an EEA-3. And likewise, BPA submitted comments that said that uh, CAISO staff promised them that they wouldn't cut before an EEA-3. So I'm just hoping you could clarify what your interpretation of the tariff is and what CAISO's policy is. Yeah, good, good question, Michelle. Um, I'm gonna ask for a little help on this one, um, if possible. Sure, CB, I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it. I think, Michelle, in the policy and in the tariff, we were, the only EEA we called out was EEA-3, and we do have a clause in there that says, consistent with good utility practice, uh, the CAISO system operators have other options. I think that the comments that we received on the PRR may have misinterpreted that, and they kind of claim that the CAISO through the final policy and the tariff is committing to always doing that prior to an EEA-3. So I think to the extent that we can clarify this language to make sure that you're comfortable that we're not limited only to an EEA-3, that's, that's I think, fine, but I don't think yeah, Danny, we would agree yeah. that the comments yeah. you gave are consistent with what's in the tariff and the final proposal. Yeah, I think that our position is not that you must cut before an EEA-3, but that you have the ability to cut before an EEA-3, and I think that's consistent with the tariff language. When I read the BPM, I don't see any of that flexibility language. And I'm concerned that if this is what effectuates your tariff and this is what governs what your operators do, they will believe that they may only cut in an EEA-3, which I don't think was the flexibility, you know, that the tariff affords and that, you know, we went through, the, and the, nor is that consistent with the final decision. So if you could point me to the so language think, in the BPM yeah. that provides that flexibility, because I don't see it. And also, I mean, if you told BPA that you will only cut at an EEA-3, that seems a little bit concerning as well. Yeah, so I think in the next round of BPM language, we can more clearly state that our operators are always able to operate within good utility practice, which 
kind of does include flexibility to to do what they see fit to maintain grid reliability. I think regarding uh, when we would cut these, we've been pretty clear. We imagine that LPTs would be cut after, after HASP in very, very limited circumstances where uh, firm load was at risk. And I think we've been consistent on that point this entire time. And it, does that mean that you could cut before an EEA3? I think that the operators could choose to do so if they deem that was appropriate. I, d I don't want to presume when they would do that. I, I suspect this would most likely happen when we're in an EEA3. Okay. I just don't see that flexibility in the BPM language, and I thought the BPM had to be consistent with the tariff. And the tariff does provide that flexibility. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I'm trying confirming to that the, fir my the first sentence, right, now, or, right, the first sentence of the tariff language does provide for Kaiser to curtail in, in other situations um, before before the EEA3. I think what, what Danny's getting at is that it's our understanding that our operators are using it as a reliability tool, um, which we tried to provide visibility in that into the, in the BPM. But, it, it, I mean, that doesn't change the, the first sentence of that very clear tariff authority. So, if, if we're just right. t talking about a few, I think what Danny said is, you know, he was going to add some language before the re before this goes to the next stage. So, we have, uh, you'll see that published in a few days to incorporate that first sentence in, into, into this. But we should be clear that, that this is a reliability tool to, you know, uh, to, when we're in an EEA3 or in the situations where it could be used to avoid that, it, it's not clear that cutting LPTs would always avoid that. Yeah, I understand. It just seems like you should, the BPM should have very clearly, should very clearly state what the tariff very clearly states. So thanks for that. Thanks for your comment, Michelle. All right, so there are no additional um, questions in queue. I'm sorry, Michelle, did you say there were no more questions in queue? Uh, nope, there are no additional questions in the queue at this time. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide and I believe uh, Mike Rue will be presenting that, uh, PRR 1501. IPR 1501 updates uh, details and requirements for hybrid dynamic limits. Uh, the reason is to um, add additional guidance to details around hybrid dynamic limits and submitting hybrid dynamic limits. I had initial comments from SRP, which we will respond to shortly. The uh, initial comment period expired on May 16th and moving on to post recommendation. I do not see any questions in queue. Okay, we can move to the next slide, please. And it would be PRR 1505 and Guillermo will be presenting. Thank you, Christina. This is a twofold change. We're adjusting a set of penalty prices that are applicable to the real time market. One set of changes has to do with ensuring that we are compliant with the tariff language. There were two specific values in the tariff that were not transferred to the VPN description. They were misaligned, and these changes effectively align the tariff values with the values that should be posted in the business practice manual. The second set of penalty price changes has to do with uh, enhancement we identified based on a policy initiative that we implemented back in May 2022. And we are adjusting specific penalty prices that are listed in the in the change regarding the treatment of import export for pack quantities and basis schedules. And they are applicable specifically to the 15 minute market. These are not for the hash market, neither for the integrated forward market. These are specifically for the 15 minute mark. And uh, we put this as a emergency change to take effect effectively immediately. Uh, we identified at 
released the, the second set of items as early as late 2022. We introduced this topic in one of our December market performance forum meetings. We introduced the, the expected change and the reason for that. And it was until now that we have fully calibrated the, the prices and we proceed with this change to take effect immediately. And that was on May 8th. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, there are currently no questions in queue. We can go ahead and move to the next slide. Yeah. Our last two PRRs are, in, are with the Energy Imbalance Market BPM, and we'll start with CB for 1498. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so PRR 1498, this PRR um, introduces the concept of assistance energy transfers, um, and then it also provides instructions for BAAs on how to voluntarily opt in and opt out of, of being eligible for such uh, assistance energy transfers uh, through designation requests. Um, this PRR also provides language that is specifically for the ISO BAA um, criteria for how it would opt in or opt out. Um, so all of that is uh, in this PRR. Um, one, one change here is that this would be effective no sooner than July 1st, um, whereas I think previously we were talking about June 1st, uh, we're now saying no sooner than July 1st. Um, and also wanted to mention that we posted responses to stakeholder questions, and that's available as well. Um, and maybe one more comment is that we will um, be providing an updated version of the BPM language this week, I think, to clarify a couple items. Um, for example, one clarification would deal with, um, I, I don't think the original language was particularly clear around why opt-out requests are needed uh, potentially for BAAs. And so we just wanted to clarify that, that even though you start with a default value of, uh, every day has a default value of opt-out, um, if you opt in for multiple days, um, even let's just say a month or so, you can subsequently opt out and, re and supersede your earlier designation request. Um, as long as you do that with, five business days, at least five business days in advance. So that's the kind of clarification I think you'll see um, in the upcoming um, uh, posting. So any, um, any questions? You have a question in queue. Michelle, your line's unmuted, you may go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle Keto with the Energy Division. I've got a bunch of questions. The first is, can you explain why you, you classified this as an emergency BPM? Um, Heather or Dan, do you want to take that one? That that was to keep with the June 1 effective date. The the BPM includes both CAISO criteria and then uh, a bunch of stuff that would apply to, to other folks who are using the product. I'm going to say less controversial points. We, we wanted to make sure those were effective for June 1. A, as you just heard CB, you know, update that the June 1 date isn't isn't needed anymore. Um, we, we can talk offline if, if that's still a problem, but, you know, we're looking at more of a July 1 date. But, um, Michelle, it was just to cover those other sections of the PRR that are um, okay. more explanatory. Yeah but, yeah, but then why didn't you make the LPT exports, the EEA, to reclassification uh, an emergency one as well? I don't know. It could, it, it could have been an oversight. I think at the end of the day, it's probably a slight. I don't know how much of a difference it makes now that we have a delay on the implementation. Um, we were going to clean up all of those those dates, um, but I think it was likely an oversight on the on the LPT fourteen ninety seven. I think is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also um, think Heather, there may have been a a sequencing issue. The fourteen ninety seven and fifteen hundred. Uh, I think we moved to recommend during the last. And I think we're keeping them in recommend, whereas 1498, we kept an initial. And so it was under emergency to still make the June 1 date as you were 
pointing out. Oh, that is correct. Thank you for reminding me, Danny. Yeah, yeah that, that was correct. It's because we held back um, this PRR in initial stage is, is why it was transferred to the emergency status for so that those um, other provisions could go into effect. But sorry, Michelle, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, so I, I have some other questions. Um, we did ask in our um, questions whether Kaiso would be committing to include the BIP in the RSD, and I don't feel like I got a clear answer on that. I think we don't have authority here I'm in the PIR sure, but... to change to change our to change the RSE. The tariff doesn't allow us to reflect in the RSE, um, you know, resources that aren't aren't deployed or we don't know if they're going to be deployed at that time. So uh, our answer, I think, the clear answer is it's not within the scope of this BPM to make those type of changes. But okay, we are so doing. What I'm hearing is that we are doing RSE phase. Correct. Uh, it's it, unless they're in the market or otherwise enabled um, before the RSE is run. Um, but we did say in our written responses, which I hope everyone reviewed, they, they are provided on the BPM website. RSE phase three is scheduled to begin in a few months. And, and we do anticipate that this topic would be a part of that discussion. And that's everyone else's understanding, because I thought that you guys kind of committed to including um, BIP in the RSC because they would activate it at a an earlier stage. So is Kaiso walking that back now? Um, I think there were a number of days. There is is the question. It, did I did I did I, I do we have a written decision on when the the BIP is available for that earlier marker that I think you just referenced, Michelle? I don't know. I'm just trying to get clarity on this. This was a really important thing to us. So, so I think what we tried to convey in our written response is when we have confirmation that resources at, at T40, when the RSE is run, that resources will be available, we can count those in our RSC under our existing tariff. If yeah. we don't have that confirmation, which I don't understand for the BIP exists right now. So that's why I, if we have that confirmation, I do understand folks have been having various discussions. The last we heard where that was still discussions. If, if those discussions have finalized, I don't know if everyone on the team has been updated. So we, we're not trying to make a, we're not trying to walk back a commitment that was made or, or otherwise change. I think it's just uh, unresolved about whether those resources are available prior to T40. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to understand um, when your understanding of putting the uncertainty adder in, because when I look at the uh, FRP uncertainty adder, I believe that you guys have you guys have the ability. Well, first of all, it's my understanding that it's kind of uncertain that it jumps around a lot. Second, my understanding in looking at some of the data is that it can be two or three thousand megawatts. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to understand when you're going to put that uncertainty adder in the RSC the, at the earliest. So, so the uncertainty adder is is included in the T40 RSE analysis. So two sides of the equation, kind of you know the supply supply side, what you have, I demand don't side, the what you need. Adder is, sorry, Heather. Sorry to interrupt you. I don't think the uncertainty adder is included right now. Um, can you guys? Danny, it can you correct me? It should be in the flex ramp test, right? It was removed from the capacity test. Okay. And when will it be added into the capacity, back into the capacity test at the earliest? Uh, I believe the earliest probably would be uh, upon further discussion in phase three. Okay. I don't think we have any plans in the near term to add it back to the capacity test. Okay. That's what I was looking for clarity about. Okay. Um, and then I just want to go through um, an example and try to understand. I'm really still struggling with this. I, I feel like we put a lot of examples in there and I think some of them were misunderstood. So if we have 4,000 megawatts um, of advisory transfers in the HASC process, and that facilitates 4,000 megawatts of LPT exports, and then let's say a tie goes down and at T minus 40, we can't tag those HASC advisory HASP imports, right? So we fail the RSE. You know, CAISO itself was balanced, right? 
Kaiso has the same, you know, enough resources to cover its load. Um, so now, I, I wait a second. I guess we don't include. No, we don't. We never included the advisory, and we don't include the exports. Um, the only LPTs, Michelle, that would be included would be LPTs that have cleared the day ahead, and then the hash process, but. Right. All okay. Of yeah. Time LPTs in your example would be excluded from the CAISO's obligation. And yeah, ideally, but say, if our but process is working, then we should be balanced coming out of RUC and be able to meet right. and have reserves to meet those LPT exports. But let's assume that we're on like July 9th in 2021 when we didn't foresee the tie going down. So the the exports clear the day ahead. They clear the HASP right because it was post HASP. At in some point that it went down. So post task, it's included. I guess my question is, are we going to pay um, for EIM transfers at penalty prices or are we going to cut LPTs? I think the situation you're identifying was it's something that we discussed at depth in the policy process. And I think we discussed it with the MSC. The concern is that a major contingency happens that exhausts CAISO's reserves and they're unable to, to recover them between HASP and the T40, so in about a 20 minute window. And I think our answer at that time is the same as it is now is we're not gonna handcuff our system operators with any hard rules that they have to try to manage in an emergency. We want them focusing on system reliability. So uh, operator, Discretion consistent with good utility practices, I, I think what we want to go forward with. Okay, but does that mean that if we have to pay the penalties on 4,000 megawatts of penalties? Interruption. I'm sorry, we have just a few minutes left and we have one more PRR. Is it possible to move this conversation outside of this meeting to cover the rest of your questions? Is that something we can arrange? Well, maybe you could tell me what the process is going forward. Uh, sure, I'll jump in, so I think, Danny, and, and, or go okay, ahead. Okay, Heather. Yeah, please go ahead. No, 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 no. You first, ladies first. Uh, okay, I think we were going to hold this in our initial comment period, or in the, in the initial phase. Um, I know here it says next step post recommendation. We we had made that before um, we had gotten full visibility into the, the delay, slight delay in implementation. Um, but, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, sorry, we're going to move to recommendation stage, post recommendation. And we will, we could take comments there, um, but at the, at the end of the day, Danny, you can jump in on some options, but I think the goal is to allow another round of comments here. Yeah, we're, we're really hoping for another round of comments, uh, especially in light of the response that the ISO was able to provide to the last round of comments we received. Uh, we're trying to get the criteria right about when the CAISA would potentially utilize AET. And so to the extent that you have any comments or think that think the criteria needs to be changed, we look for that. And to the extent that we can uh, provide any clarification offline, as Christina mentioned, please let us know and we'll be happy to further discuss. Okay, can I just maybe ask one thing? Are you gonna post any reports or do any analysis to show whether we're paying for something that we're not getting anything for? Like if the I mean, one of the big concerns, obviously, just one more thing and then I'll, I'll go. Um, one of the big concerns is that, um, you know, the current criteria are never or have never been binding, right? So in this case, we'll be paying a penalty and we won't be getting any additional um, transfers, right? Because everyone puts their bids in before HASP. So it's not like things just show up in the FMM. So is it somebody going to be doing some studies about how much money this costs us? and how much benefit or, or lack of benefit we get from it? So I can't speak for the market analysis team or the DMM at CAISO, but I do know Guillermo's market analysis team regularly does report on market efficiency, which I think that this could be fairly classified as, and that the DMM also does robust reporting on how the RSC is functioning. I know that they tried to actually proxy the cost of what this would have been in the policymaking phase. So. Uh, 
I would like to think that they would be interested in providing that type of information as well, Michelle, but we can follow up with them. Okay, and then just, sorry, one more follow up. And then also, I think it's really important who's paying. So in the circumstance I was just discussing, if California load pays, but we're essentially just facilitating the LPT exports that the operators don't want to cut, that doesn't really seem fair to California customers. So that's another aspect of it, right? So it's not just reliability, but it's cost allocation as well, I would assume that everyone would be concerned about. Well, let's have a follow. Let's have a follow up because because Christina in the chat, we do have a hard cut off at noon, and we do have to cover one more PRR. We have another round of comments, so I, let's just move move this along. Let's cover the next one, and and I think continue this discussion later. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sorry, we only have an hour. We had a lot of comments this this month. Apologize for that. If we could go to fifteen oh six, and Jacob will be covering that. Thank you, Jacob. So 1506, this is also the Washington WEIM GHG enhancements project and includes the updated calculations for the default energy bid, the commitment costs for resources subject to Washington's greenhouse gas compliance program. This is a temporary alternative solution that will remain in effect until the full functionality can be implemented in well, later, but we expect it in fall 2023. Um, this is an emergency BR, uh, PRR and is effective 5-1. 2023, we had no initial comments. The initial comment period expired May 16th, 2023, or 2023, and our next step is to post recommendation. If we don't have any questions on that, we can move to the last slide. I do have questions in here. Okay. All right, one moment. Let me just see something. All right, I see Alan. Alan, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Alan, your line is unmuted. If you have a question, you may go ahead. All right, I don't think Alan has a question. Maybe he changed his mind. And I don't see any additional questions in queue. Oh, wait, I think you're ready to stand again. <laughs> All right, Alan, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hey, did you unmute me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, can you're you unmuted, me? Alan. You may go ahead. I can hear uh, you, Alan. Okay. Uh, Alan Mech, SDG&E. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on the concern that Michelle was raising. Um, did I hear of, over the course of your discussion that LPT exports can only be cut at EEA 2, or is it at any EEA stage, 1, 2, or 3? I think the tariff lays out, Alan, that LPT exports can be curtailed at the sole discretion of the system operator with, uh, under good utility practice and then kind of tries to put when we think that would happen. And I think that's what we're going to look to update the BPM language to reflect. Uh, okay. What does that mean? But uh, I think that means that if they see a reliability reason why they need to curtail OPT exports, that they'll have the ability to do so to maintain system reliability. Uh, okay. So I, I, I think that Michelle's concern here really still stands then because I'm just going to put our cards out there. If if we have an event like Michelle described where um, where we're having to purchase AET um, energy and pay obviously the rather high premium of 1,000, God forbid, up to $2,000, depending on what the reference trading hub um, price is going at, uh, if it ends up being $2,000 plus uh, the energy is already coming in at two thousand dollars. So that's four thousand dollars a megawatt hour, all to support LPT exports. There's a uh, we're not going to be happy about that. Um, I, I guess that's, that's I understand, and I, I think this was something that we 
we kind of ran through in the in the policy process that that is a potential outcome. We think it's pretty unlikely, and uh, the, the solution of bounding our system operators to a, a rigid set of rules that they have to try to maintain for tariff compliance during an assistant a system emergency wasn't appropriate to us. We wanted them focusing on maintaining reliability. But okay. Alan, I think that we'll, we're likely to have some follow-up conversations on this because we, we want to make sure yourself and Michelle are comfortable. So we will look to include you in those conversations. Okay, thank you. No additional questions in queue. We can move to the uh, last slide, please. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, the next BPM PRR review monthly meeting is scheduled for June 27th at 11 a.m. If you have any comments or questions, please contact us at bpm underscore cm at kaiso.com. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.